So we have a lot of uh, content to cover today, a lot of interesting uh, anecdotes and information from our experiencing, uh, experiencing things in the, in the field. So we're gonna get going. Thanks everyone for joining us. First off, uh, who are the two people that you see on webcam right now? Well, my name is Brian Martinovich. I am the Director of Customer Services for Login BSI. And that's a fancy way of saying that if you are a, a current customer of ours or interested in, in uh, evaluating the tool, um, my team helps to facilitate your utilization of that. Um, and with that said, we'll go ahead and uh, turn it over to Todd, my, uh, my guest presenter today. Todd, if you could introduce yourself. Absolutely. Thanks, Brian. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Todd Kirkland. I am the Director of Operations and Customer Success here at Jetpatch been so for the last couple of years. Uh, similar to, I have a similar role to Brian. Uh, in addition, provide a lot of cross-functional support, both on our product teams as well as our sales team. And really excited to show you and talk to you uh, about what we have today. So with all that said, uh, let's get down to business, right? Let's set an agenda. So what are we going to be talking about today? Um, because outside of an abstract, you know, there's obviously some content that needs to fill that out, right? So we're talking about addressing security vulnerabilities and doing that through the patching process. And do you have the right mindset to carry yourself uh, forward given the, the rate of change, which is rapidly accelerating? Also, transforming the change management process in order to facilitate um, the turnaround time necessary to respond to those vulnerabilities, as well as add applications in your stack as well. And do you follow uh, the best practices? Um, and then finally, you know, you're going to need tools in your tool belt in order to, to achieve your objective. So we'll, we'll talk about the actual tools necessary uh, to do that. So um, we're going to go ahead and turn it over to Todd, who's going to kind of give you a little bit of, of the background of patching in general, as he's the, uh, the expert in that area. I would maybe say I'm the expert as a, as a testing individual. So uh, Todd? Great. Thank you, Brian. Uh, so this problem, as you all are aware, has been around. It's been around for decades. I have a few examples here. I won't go into too much detail, but these are a selection of articles from the last 15 to 20 years, uh, all the way back in 2004, showing that the number of vulnerabilities are increasing year after year. Uh, back in 2013, showing that the majority of data breaches are due to known exploits, as well as even if five, six years ago. Uh, the length or the time to remediate being 120 days. And when you look at these statistics and you look at these historical articles, are you, you must be asking yourself, is that still today? Is that really still relevant today? And unfortunately, the answer is yes. Uh, in 2020, there was a 65% increase in critical vulnerability discovery. Still in 2019, the majority of breaches involved uh, unpatched vulnerabilities. And although we've made improvements in the time to remediate, we're now 40% better at 71 days. Uh, we're still not where the industry needs to be. Uh, for example, the industry is driving towards a 14-day SLA. Uh, there was a study a few years ago um, that indicated that the average time for an exploit to be to be occur would be 22 days. In addition, even more recently, and the last month, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of the news regarding the Microsoft Exchange vulnerability attack. Uh, there was guidance from the White House indicating that you need hours, not days, to address this problem as a number of attempts were doubling every few hours. And at that time of writing, which was on the 13th, um, over, over 80,000 vulnerable servers were still out there. So you maybe thousand seems like a like a pretty large number, Todd. It is out there, and this is just one example. Um, these vulnerabilities are coming out faster, uh, and the exploiters are only being coming more aggressive uh, year after year. So that begs the question: Why are we not at that 14-day SLA? Uh, looking at a one of the largest studies done independently by the Poneman Institute sponsored by ServiceNow. Uh, this was a sampling over 80,000 IT and security practitioners around the world. Um, the majority of the reasons we had to boil down to these six, seven that you see on the left-hand side, all of which were agreed causing more than 50% of the reason. 
things such as not enough resources on my team or not enough visibility across the enterprise, across my ecosystem, across all my tools, not even not having the ability to do downtime appropriately or even tolerating downtime to begin with, inability to prioritize uh, what, what to go after first and where to, to focus efforts, lack of tracking to make sure that once things are fixed, if they're being reported on appropriately, and of course, as you can expect, human error along the way, as well as still too much manual efforts in this day and age. And I think with that, we want to do a quick poll. Um, we're going to put this in the chat. Um, how many resources do you all use? So we're gonna let the poll run here for a few, a few minutes. We really appreciate your participation in it. It helps us to understand how many of you have dedicated teams in order to address this, uh, this issue within your organization. It seems like the majority of you have 10 or more. That's pretty uh, impressive to me. Some of you don't know, uh, I would encourage you to uh, reach out to your you're testing individuals. They're helping ensure that you have uh, usable applications. Everyone wants to get their jobs done. They don't want to wait for five minute boot times. We're going to give this a few more moments here and then we're going to go ahead and close the poll. So, surprisingly, as it turns out, most of you have 10 or more dedicated resources. That's Quite a bit, actually. And if you think about it, that's that's 10 salaries, uh, that's 10 instances of individuals that might get it wrong or not do it the same way. They might even work uh, in different teams that don't communicate with each other. Um, so thank you for participating. We're going to go ahead and, uh, and and move along here. Todd, back to you. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, so really that, that does show more of a, that traditional model, right? Um, you hire a lot of people. That expedites costs, um, but that doesn't necessarily solve all the problems, right? As we mentioned before, the more people means more rooms for error, means more communication, potential breakdown in communication. So how do we change that? How do we change that model? Uh, and that's why we wanna introduce a chef, shift left mindset. Now, some of you may have heard of this concept before, uh, primarily in the last few years, it's been applied to a DevOps perspective. Um, for those of you who are not aware, uh, there was another research for the Poneman Institute this time back in 2017 that found that vulnerabilities detected early in the development process may cost around 80 bucks, whereas vulnerabilities found in production may cost $7,600, which is almost 100 times more expensive. Really, the same thing applies uh, in the patch deployment uh, and testing apparatus. Uh, our experience with customers really show um, that the majority of the time and effort spent at this reactive late stage um, where the cost is even higher. In fact, we actually spoke with the customer a few months ago that was remediating on a quarterly basis. And when we asked them, how are, why aren't you doing it at a monthly or even faster rate? The biggest thing they said is that they don't have enough resources to keep up with the necessary patch testing demands. Um, and of course, as we mentioned, hiring is not a scalable approach as vulnerabilities continue to grow at an alarming rate. And Brian, I think you also have another customer that you've worked with recently with a similar problem. Absolutely. Um, so in this particular example, uh, it's an insurance provider and, and probably there's a fair amount of you on this call that are currently utilizing them, right? Uh, believe it or not, people are still making a transition to Windows 10. I know that's a surprising thing to say uh, in 2021, but this is exactly what they're doing. And the reason why it's taking them so long is because in large organizations such as theirs, the stakes are higher, right? If you make a mistake, you, you can really cause a major issue. So the question was, you know, what is the impact of running their security software um, with some improvements that are made for, for efficiency? And so, you know, the antivirus vendor that was providing this solution in this particular example said there's no or minimal impact to the number of users that you'll be able to get on an individual um, VM or host basis. Uh, and so 
because they are a customer of Login BSI, they have the ability to actually test that out, right? So what they did was they had the environment with the antivirus software, with the settings the way that they wanted, and um, they had the antivirus software with a, a configuration that I had um, set up a test scenario where they could identify the issues. And they actually didn't see a difference between when the settings were turned on and when the settings were turned off, right? So basically what that indicated was that although the setting was put in place, which should had an impact on the, the overall number of users that they could get and, and the application performance and the logon rates and all that fun stuff, the setting actually wasn't uh, doing what it was supposed to. So, you know, this is an issue that took months to address. You have uh, subject matter experts from all the major contributors, presentation level antivirus software, because they weren't really sure where the issue um, existed. But at the end of the day, through that um, testing process, we were able to identify and correct an issue that um, basically impacted our ability to support those users by 20 to, to 50%. And when you talk about an organization that has you know, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of users, realistically, you know, that 20 to 50% miss, you're gonna have to make up with hardware resources. And we're talking millions and millions of dollars, right? So with all that said, how do you accomplish that? And you really got to start with a few principles. And there's three of them that we want to share with you today. Uh, the first one is the principle of predictive analytics. It's a proactive approach that helps you collect and correlate data from all your different data sources in an environment that can automatically identify and resolve failures. The second one is process mining which is an approach that helps you facilitate and automate the process as much as possible, enabling you to significantly decrease your time to remediate. And then last but not least is the approach of performance confidence, right? Allows you to analyze the implications of the business beyond the remediation process. Kind of what Brian was talking about, really understand the impact of patching across your environment to ensure business continuity. Obviously very critical, uh, to proactively address these implications, ensuring successful and safe remediation, and also help reduce the that percentage of folks that have no tolerance for downtime. And honestly, this is only possible with a constant feedback loop, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And with that, Brian, now that we've shifted our mindset, you know, we know, we need to change our processes. So Brian, tell us, how are we going to change the change management process? Yeah, that's that's a great that's a great uh, point, right? So, I mean, it seems a little redundant to say changing the change management process, right? But that's exactly what you need to do. But in order to create the change necessary to facilitate uh, accelerating the patching process, you need to understand what the current landscape is, right? And and you know, to go back to our our poll question too, I mean. Most of the, the respondents here, and I think it was like 70% of you participated, were saying that you have 10 or more resources. So, I mean, you know, 10 or more could be hundreds of people testing hundreds of applications. So really, you want to talk about enterprise uh, level built-in complexity. You have security and regulatory compliance requirements, right? You have distributed IT organizational structures and silo groups for, you know, infrastructure, application ownership, um, a security, uh, a policy administration. So you have a lot of people with different data sets and a lot of opinions on things, as well as you know several hundreds of tools in certain instances, right? Um, also, uh, IT and security maturity model, right? We see organizations, even of the largest scale, that have a relatively immature um, testing methodology. Right, and so what are the consequences of that? Right, there are, there are significant business implications here. So if an application doesn't perform, or it's slower, or it slows down over time, or it doesn't work at all, obviously in organizations like medical and financial institutions, there's a direct dollar cost associated with it. So if you make the wrong configuration, or you introduce the change in your environment without knowing what the consequences are, you're playing with, you know, uh, people's money, and and you know it needs to be more accurate when we talk about um, finances. Yeah. The oh. other, yeah. Go ahead, Todd. The other thing I wanted to note here is that uh, that same study I was referencing earlier, the Poneman Institute with the major delays, 
Uh, in that same study, they mentioned that 40% of self-identified as having a high security maturity, but even within that, the overwhelming majority still pointed to human error as a, the re primary reason of a data breach. So whether or not you're low or high, small, large company, this issue, whether it be human error or not enough resources, is it's, it's a common, it's a common problem. Right, so what do you do about all of this, right? You need a constant feedback loop. You can no longer wait, you know, as that senior security admin at the White House said, you can't wait days. And, you know, five, 10 years ago, you had months to address these things, right? Like Microsoft wasn't rolling over an update to their operating system or a major iterative release for, for sometimes years. I'm sure some of you on this call sat on Windows XP for an unusually long period of time because you didn't have the telemetry data in place necessarily to facilitate that move, right? And so you need to be constantly feeding data into the system about the application performance in the production, testing and pre-production phase and identifying any um, uh, game-breaking scenarios well in advance because we've seen once it hits those end users, that's the wrong time to find those, those issues, right? So, you know, we'll provide some visualizations and some breakdowns so that you can understand, you know, where you've been to understand what your normal transactionary times are deep into the applications. We can identify and control when those patches are applied and the set of workload behaviors um, that we're uh, testing in your environments to identify what that impact is on the end user experience, right? And we focus on a couple of things, right? The log on. So a user experiences their system when they're accessing either their desktop or their application, how slow that is, right? And then they also experience that from an application performance standpoint. So not just opening up those applications, but also, you know, if I'm in that ERP and I'm moving resources around, or I'm in that medical software and I'm checking a patient in. Again, those are activities where there is a direct dollar so, uh, cost associated with them. We can tell you if you're instituting a change. And in this particular example, we're talking about going from one version of Citrix to another, which is a pretty significant change. We want to identify and quantify that in an easily understandable um, way and then feed that data back into the process, right? So what does that kind of look like um, from a, a global uh, scale of things, right? Because we're all sitting here in our homes. Welcome to my home. Welcome to Todd's home over there. We're actually in Boston. Some of you are from Egypt, it seems. We're glad to have you all here. But we want to identify an issue. We want to isolate that before it becomes systemic and it feeds across um, your global workforce, right? Great. And so with all that said, we need an ecosystem approach to address um, the issues that we've outlined for you, right? So Todd, I think that you're probably best suited for, for answering this question for people. Absolutely. So what does this kind of modern ecosystem approach look like? Um, really, it drills down into three, three, I would say, concepts, being able to predict, patch, perform, and that constant feedback loop. And then in order to do that, there's really five things. The first is that you have to have an ecosystem that's able to collect and connect to all various data sources, whether they're repositories, endpoints themselves, vulnerability scanners, on-prem, in the cloud, you name it. Uh, then it has to be, that approach has to be able to correlate the data, analyze it, understand uh, the vulnerabilities and the patch requirements out there. Second, using a predictive patching model, uh, in order to maximize your success rates and understand what issues you can fix proactively, automatically before your patching starts, and then taking you through a hyper automated governed process where you really see maximal uh, coverage and maximal um, efficiency every step of the way. And of course, afterwards, you need to be able to ensure that your applications are running and performing at the level you need for business continuity. And of course, last but not least, you need to be able to present that data appropriately custom in a custom way, in a functional way for that complete visibility of your overall healthier system of your environment. So Brian, with all of that in mind, 
what kind of technologies can the industry use to implement this approach? Well, I'm actually not going to give the goods away right quite yet here, right? I'm actually going to make you guys do a little bit more work for me. So I have one more poll question for you. How much time are those 10 plus users within your environment spending on their ta uh, patching process, right? So I'm going to uh, launch the poll here. We're going to give it a few minutes. Um, looking forward to see how everyone's uh, doing out there. One day, some people are speed demons. I'm a little bit concerned about how accurate those testing results are going to be in one day, but I'll, I'll trust you. Uh, we got some 10 days. 10 days is growing. 10 days is growing a lot. 10 days continues to grow. You guys are quick on the trigger here. We're going to give you a few more moments here to, to fill out the quiz question. How much time are you spending? on your patching process. You've got 40% of the votes in. Most of you say, oh, a few more. Keep going. I'm going to close it here in a second. And the audience says 10 days. 63% of the respondents on the poll say it takes them 10 days to roll out a patch. Now, what's happening in those 10 days? I can almost guarantee you some nefarious actor is trying to get into your systems. So good luck with that one. Uh, don't want to be uh, one of those new news headlines. But we're going to help you uh, get to that one day mark. And how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to give you the right tools for the job, right? So Jetpatch is going to quantify and, and uh, gather all the necessary changes that you need to make in your environment. And we can talk about applications and the various types of changes involved there. You have endpoints as part of the equation as well. And then uh, last but not least, and my personal favorite, addressing security and compliancy um, uh, issues, right? And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna give you a centralized platform, a single pane of glass where you can manage those changes. And not only that, where you can actually predict what your future performance will be like and help you to go back to that shift left mindset. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna do that by focusing on the end user experience, how your end users experience your systems. Right? And what is our objective here? What is the benefit to the enterprise? Well, you know, A, first and foremost, we all like money, right? So we're gonna decrease the cost and we're gonna increase your salaries, right? Because now we have more money in the budget for those people that are driving the process. We're gonna save you time, right? That 71 days, what was that on average, Todd? You're the expert from patch release process, 71 days. That 71 days, that's not our audience, apparently. Our audience is, is patching things in 10 days, which seems rather optimistic for me, but you all seem like trustworthy people, so we'll, we'll believe you when you say that. Uh, and we're gonna maximize the end user experience and we're gonna reduce your risk, right? So I'm sure you're all asking, what does this look like from a practical standpoint? That's right. So we have a quick video for you all. It'll just kind of show you exactly how that environment, your environment can be patched with Jetpatch automatically, then how it can be automatically tested and reviewed by Login VSI with those test feedback results feeding right back into Jetpatch, really going through that constant feedback loop as we've been mentioning. So let's go ahead and play the video. Here's a remediation plan that Jetpatch automatically created. It started, it patched, but it does not end here. Now Jetpatch makes sure your business operations and revenues are not impacted. How? By automatically testing the applications running on the patched endpoints. As you may notice, Login Enterprise automatically opens the remote desktop application and begins testing on all designated endpoints. As you see on screen, this process can contain more than one application test as well. In this scenario, we are testing Notepad and then Paint. Once completed, the process will end and close out the application. All done automatically. Now we just need to see the results. Jetpatch will help break down your patching results, while Login VSI will provide the necessary information about the testing of your applications. Though, I want to narrow down on one thing in the PDF that they provide, and that is the application's performance. 
This statistic can be particularly useful when deciding whether the application has been installed successfully, and furthermore, whether the application has been installed to your standard protocol. Here's a remediation plan that Jetpack. So Todd, like the video so much, he's gonna play it for you again. No, but seriously, one of the things that you guys probably didn't notice was in the upper right-hand corner of that video was a was a timestamp, right? And that whole entire process was executed on an automated basis over the course of several hours. So if we go back to our poll question, basically most of you are saying that it's taking you at least 10 days to roll those patches out. We can consolidate that timeline. We can make you much more accurate by providing a, an automated um, process and a consistency in, in testing steps, right? So, uh, you know, to conclude, patching remediation is long overdue for a modernization hyper automation. And how do you do that? Well, you do that by taking those existing tool sets and integrating them together to accelerate um, the process and the accuracy of your release release cycles right so we'll cover a, a, another couple use cases um, that that our customers are, are seeing in the field as well you know it's not just patching applications that already exist in your environment it's also onboarding additional um, applications because by adding an additional app to the stack you're introducing variability on um, variance instability and so now you can just onboard the app develop the testing scenario, add it to your testing coverage plan, add it to your remediation steps, and automate that end-to-end, -end, right? Additionally, we also see a lot of our customers have centralized uh, desktop and application management platforms. I'm sure most of you have you know, Citrix or Horizon, or you're using Windows Virtual Desktop, or you're getting your feet wet with Windows Virtual Desktop. So this is a one-to-many um, scenario. And so, you know, basically that base image, or in certain cases with large scale enter enterprises, those hundreds or those thousands of base images will be served up to hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of users. And so you'll have a compounded uh, effect if you have an image where you're not doing the appropriate level uh, of testing there as well. And so, you know, to conclude and round things out, right, um, through login BSI and through Jetpatch's uh, solutions, you'll have a complete remediation um, set of platforms, right? So what are we doing? Well, we're minimizing business and operational risk, right? We're ensuring your business performance by focusing on the end user experience, right? We feel very strongly that end user experience is the KPI to success in what we do as IT professionals. We're automating the process from start to finish, right? We're eliminating human error. We are accelerating by automating. Um, and, and, and ultimately what we're doing is we're introducing governance and best practices in the process. So we uh, actually went through this quite quickly. <laughs> Uh, and but that's fine though because I like to think that the most valuable part of this is the interaction with the audience because Todd and I will sit up here and talk until we're blue in the face but ultimately what's really important is what you guys are getting out of this presentation and whether or not you find this helpful to you so before we go into QA and we actually have a few questions already from the audience that we'd like to get to I want to run one last poll and the poll is quite simply this right are you currently testing applications post patching? I'm hoping that most of you are going to say yes. Some of you are saying no already. More of you are saying yes than you're saying no. Hopefully that number continues to grow. We'll leave this poll open for a little bit longer. 30% of the votes in currently. Okay, good. So glad to see that 77% of people so far are saying yes to this poll. We're gonna let it run here for another minute or so. Not literal minute, because we're, we're trying to get to the questions, but all right. And survey says that 80% of you, fortunately, are testing the consequences of your uh, patching and remediation steps. So kudos to you. You guys are all 
on the appropriate path forward. Now we just need to accelerate the process for you. So with all of that said, I'm going to stop talking here. I know that's unusual. We have a few questions. Um, one of the questions was, Todd, can you talk about tracking from slide number seven as far as major delays in the patching process? Sure, yeah. So I think um, a really important piece there is, okay, you have all these vulnerabilities and you need to apply them, let's say various different groups across your ecosystem. You really need some sort of methodology and tool that's able to show you clear compliance uh, and multiple, I would say, slicing of that data. So whether you're looking at the environment as a whole, you're looking at slices of the whole, whether or not you're looking at the compliance over time, SLA compliance over time, you need to have a data mechanism and reporting mechanism that's able to support that. So whether or not you're on day one, day two, day three, day 10, in some cases day 50, you, you know exactly where you stand and how much more you have to go. And of course, what's also good is having kind of those snapshots of where you were to track that progress. That's really what's important um, when it comes to both your deploying of patches, but also testing afterwards. Excellent, that is a great answer. One more, we're gonna talk about some really technical stuff here, everyone, so feel free to take a coffee break if you're not interested. But the question is, how do you actually do it? So what are the technical requirements of this, right? So I'll talk about login enterprise really quickly, right? We have a simple deployment method. We have uh, enterprise ready virtual appliance. So we'll give you an OVA VHD file or uh, pick your favorite cloud provider. You can import that. You have the management portion of things. We also have a launcher component that is installed on the endpoint to either connect into the environment or drive the behaviors there. Um, and we start our users in the session um, with a login um, process, a login script as well. So uh, with that being said, Todd, if you could uh, give us some answers about Jetpatch. Actually, it's very similar, right? We also have a virtual appliance, whether it's an OVA, AMI, VHD. Uh, similarly, we have a connect uh, connector, or what we call the or an agent, the Jetpatch connector. And then similarly, we have an onboarding experience to kind of get you up and running as quickly as possible. Excellent, excellent. Uh, lots of questions coming in here. This is great. You guys are all paying attention. Fantastic. Uh, the question is, how much effort does it take to implement this solution? And is it easy to run a proof of concept? Well, that's an excellent question. And I have some uh, great news for you. We're actually um, uh, putting on a special offer as a result of your attendance of this webinar. You will exclusively get access to that. And someone from mine and Todd's team will actually work with you to ensure that this is um, delivered. Uh, and demonstrated in a timely fashion. We realize that again, we've been talking about time and we've been talking a about a demand on resources. So it would be ridiculous for both of our companies to not have a solution that slots in very easily, data that's easily digestible uh, to really get to that, that value. It's a great question there. Um, the question, next question was, are you going to provide by email a link to this recording um, of the webinar to share it with the IT department? Absolutely. Uh, we'll do you one better. If you'd like, we can set up a meeting with that IT department to talk about the solution and see if it's something that you guys would be interested in actually testing out and go so far as, as helping you to implement that within your um, current environment. Uh, next question. Pricing. If I have one product and I want to add another, can you talk about the cost of doing so? Todd? Yeah, so if you have one product and you want to add the other, uh, we definitely do have a special offer for you. Uh, don't tell anyone else if they didn't attend this webinar. Um, but basically, uh, we are doing a joint offer. Uh, we can get more into the specifics in our follow-up call, but being one of our customers will allow you to special pricing uh, as you combine our solutions together. Excellent, excellent. Man, we're getting them in quicker than I can get to them. Um, let's talk about patching feedback. Uh, someone had the database. Does this apply to databases? Yeah, do you want to talk about the testing part first? Yeah, absolutely. So from a login enterprise perspective, we will 
um, participate or utilize the database that you're, the way that your users will, which is through the front end. So typically there's going to be an application of that database. We're not going to synthetically inject transactions in there. There's plenty of solutions that'll do that. Um, and we, we could go on to that, but, but realistically by having virtual users interact with the application that that database then is facilitating, we can measure the impact of, of patching that. And Todd, I'll let you talk to the patching portion of things. Sure, yeah. Uh, so we do support some patching of some databases. Uh, this depends on what your environment needs are. So of course, when we talk, uh, we can get into the specifics, whether you're talking about SQL Server, uh, Oracle DB, except so on and so forth. Um, so depending on your needs, uh, we can assist you in different ways. Great. Uh, one more, custom testing and monitoring. Um, does your solution support applications that are developed internally? Well, uh, the, the short answer from a testing perspective is absolutely. So applications have to conform to certain standards to run inside of an operating system. And if you're using Microsoft Windows as the solution where you're providing access to your applications, we can certainly interact with them. Additionally, we understand that a lot of applications are becoming um, web, website oriented, right? And we can also interact with those in, in the same exact way. Yeah, and then uh, on our side, um, if it's a homebrew application, typically there's not patches for that homebrew application. So in fact, we have a separate module. Um, it's an agent management module that allows for custom, custom support as well. So you can actually have clear visibility and monitoring and managing reporting on that, uh, on that particular homebrew application, as well as leverage that agent management module to apply uh, changes both to the service configuration or to the version of it if you're deploying various versions of your own homebrew application. That's awesome. Man, we're getting peppered here. Uh, what is the limitation in terms of the number of servers supported? From a testing perspective, login VSI licenses their product as such, right? We're based on the number of users that you support inside of your environment. So no problem with an unlimited amount of servers in, in that, uh, that equation. Todd? Yeah, so uh, we can handle various types of environments. Uh, we've had multiple customers that are globally distributed uh, up to more than 10,000 or tens of thousand. Uh, so again, really just trying to understand the needs of your environment. We can provide the right uh, solution that meets your needs. Excellent. And did we talk about our special offer, Todd? I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting lost in my questions here. I don't know. I don't know if we used the word special offer yet. Okay, so basically the deal is this: we are really interested in, in developing um, uh, customers' utilization of the product. And so as a result of you being here, we're actually offering a special um, pricing setup for those that choose to uh, um, take a look at both solutions. So if that's interesting to you, please reach after, uh, out to us after the webinar, and we'll absolutely talk to you about uh, more specific information. Uh, about that. Uh, and with that being said, it seems like um, the questions have, have kind of uh, dried up. Uh, and I know we're a little bit early here, but I'm sure most of you have been on calls all day long. So we'll actually give you some of your time back. Uh, we really appreciate all of you being here uh, and spending some time with us today. We're really excited about an integration of the two solutions. Uh, and we hope that uh, we can deliver something very special and interesting for you guys as well. So the recording will be provided. Absolutely. We'll go ahead and forward that your direction. Arthur, not a problem. Uh, and we'll see you next time, hopefully. Todd, thank you so much for being here with me. Uh, enjoy the rest of your night, morning or afternoon, depending upon where you are. Until next time. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye for now.